Starting the recording now. So good afternoon everyone and welcome back. Uh, yeah, long day for you all, for some of you all especially. Um, and it continues a bit here. So to continue from yesterday, we were talking about the, the, the lecture yesterday. We spent talking, at least in the first part, about the properties of impulses and moving them around and, and what um, and things like sampling, how you how how you can explain sampling using impulses and, and impulses shifted in time and the sampling uh, and we spoke about the, the comb function and and how, how you develop the comb function and what happens um, when you multiply a comb function with a signal and how you get the sample signal coming out and then we close by starting to talk about these things called piecewise continuous signals and the piecewise continuous signals were those where the signal um, was for all intents and purposes unvarying in time until some particular point where um, there was a disruption in the signal and it, it changed value suddenly over a short period of time so it jumped basically from one value to another at some time and then continued along the way we call those signals piecewise continuous and we said sometimes that happens um, unintentionally, for instance, if there's a bad connection in a circuit or a bad wiring or a circuit, circuit failure or component failure for a brief period of time, um, or as happens occasionally, you have circuits and the circuits are assembled on a printed circuit board um, and soldered together. Sometimes the soldering actually is faulty, so when the board gets warm, a connection may suddenly um, not be made. A signal is lost and then the board cools on um, a short while later and the connection is re-established and the signal appears again. Those kind of discontinuous signals are, 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 are very problematic to deal with. And, and worse again, they're even more difficult to find. But what we're looking at today is kind of the effect of, of what happens when you try to do certain functions on discontinuous signals. And we will just use arbitrary examples but I'll uh, um, you could think about where the real world situations may may well come in and we also said yesterday that there are some piecewise continuous signals that may be intentional for instance a pulse train um, like this or a square wave depending on on the um, the duty cycle and we spoke about that right so this one is um, piecewise continuous because it's, it's on and off depending on the duty cycle um, for as long as you have the signal running. This too, you run this through a system and a number of things happen, right? And we'll talk about one of them a little bit late, um, uh, some, a few lectures down the road. But these kind of things too, you run this through a system and the system has to contend um, very vigorously with these changes here. So these changes, hello? Yeah, these changes here. That, that create quite um, quite a problem for most systems to handle. All right. So continuing along, if you remember again, going back in time, well, this is now past primary school. This is when you started to add maths. You remember that that a, a derivative was really a limit. Okay, that that what you did for a derivative was that you you took a you had some sort of curve. And what you did is that you take two points on the curve, you approximate that curve by a straight line, and then what you did was to find the gradient of the straight line, and then you made the two points come closer and closer together, and eventually in the limit, you had the, the derivative that you know, the dy dx or dx dt and, and, and so on. So the same sort of approach happens when, 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 when you have to do a derivative on um, a, a piecewise continuous signal. What you have to do is to look and see what happens just before the, the discontinuity, what happens just after, and then let the discontinuity, the time across the discontinuity get very small. So for instance, let's say, and as we were saying yesterday, let's say this is a, for some reason, this is a velocity. Right, so this is x dot. And we are using that velocity to find acceleration in a vehicle, right? Because we need to determine that in order for certain systems in the car to work. So you have to take, you have to take that and you have to pass it through something and you have to get the um, derivative of it. What happens, 
right? It seems fairly straightforward, and we even mentioned the fact um, in a previous lecture last week that it is possible because of we know circuits that can actually do continuous time integration and, and, and derivatives, right? Um, using the op amps, there's an op amp differentiator, so you can actually run signals within limits. It is designed to handle certain things. So, for instance, if this was going through an op amp um, differentiator, what would happen? The signal suddenly has a jump at this point in time. So we see what the issue is as a result of that. So we have it sort of broken up in two in, in, in two times, right? Let's treat all of them as discontinuity. So we have nothing before T1, right? Nothing before T1. The signal appears and runs between T1 and T2. At the T2 point, something happens and it changes value at that point very suddenly across there. And then the signal runs until time T3 and then disappears again, right? So less than T1 and greater than T3, we have nothing. And then we have some action happening inside of here. So how does a system, if, if you have some system and the system is going to determine the derivative of that, and just the example I'm using is a velocity, so this is supposed to be a velocity system going, a velocity signal going into um, some system. It may be whatever is measuring the velocity send, sending a voltage for argument's sake. So this is a voltage going in to the system in the car and the car is going to take the derivative of that voltage and the value that it gets or the result is supposed to be um, the, the acceleration that is supposed to be used to, to help the brakes work in a different um to, to help the brakes work or to react with the um the 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 um the anti-lock system or to activate some seat belt system or some safety feature just for argument's sake so we look at the system and look at what i have down below here that i can take this signal as we have it here and i can express it in that way x1 and I have ut plus t1 minus ut minus t2, right? Why is that? Why? You have to remember when we were uh, moving things along with the unit step um, last week. So ut plus t1 is what? What would ut plus t1 look like? ut plus t1 would be a step looking like this right it changes at t equal to in this case minus t1 let's assume this is zero here right so technically this should probably be minus t1 so ut plus t1 is yes it is one and it's occurring at t equal to minus one forget the sign here ut minus t2 is another unit step does this, right? So this is u t minus t2. So that one occurs at t equal to t2. This one is at t equal to minus t1, right? So if I put a minus sign here, what that does is to change by putting a minus sign in front of u t minus t2, I basically reverse the um, unit step around the t2 point. So if I just change the color here, hold on, I get a different color. So u t would look like this, All right? So this is minus u t minus t2. Yeah. So if I add the two of them, what happens here? What you're left with is that blue line. In other words, clearly garbage. 
this expression here is just simply saying that I have a function here that is one between these two points here. In other words, if I multiply xt by this function, everything, everything less than t1 will be zero, and everything less than greater than t2 will be zero. In other words, I am picking out this little bit here, right? I'm defining that. So mathematically, this is a way of defining what the signal is doing between T1 and T2. Make sense? Right? So the same approach, therefore, we can take for the other one, x2 now. x2, what we really want to do is to pick out this bit here. So that is u t minus t2, which is that bit here, and u t minus t3, which is that bit there. So the pulse is defined by that. You multiply it by x2 and we get this bit. So mathematically, we've taken the signal and now we've defined it mathematically. So let's go through and take the derivative of that and see what we get. So first things, if I were to take the derivative, what is the derivative of our unit step? An impulse, right? So we need. So at this point in time, that's all we have to remember. The derivative of our unit step is an impulse, and we have, at this point in time, look at what we had from from our little discussion. We had a unit step. We have the unit step, the first one here. Then we had the second one here. Then we have another one here, and then we have a second one here, right? So one, two, three, four, right? So just looking at that by the definition, and, and I mean, we, we did it sort of formally, but you can watch the picture and sort of and derive that. What you're going to see is that if I differentiate the signal, I'm going to have the derivative of x1 and x2, but somewhere inside of there, I have four unit steps inside of here. So I'm going to have four impulses. Yeah? So if I run it through, and you do it, here's what you have. So you have the first impulse. I take the signal. I can graph it back here. So this is my first step. I'll put this in. Let's see. So my first step, this is the first step here. It's going from nothing to whatever that value is. So if I find the derivative of this, this is going to give me an impulse here. All right, so we have the first impulse, a positive going impulse. And the magnitude of the impulse is the difference between xt just before xt just before this point and just after yeah then we go through we'll have dx dt dx1 whatever that is so it will have some funny shape we come here now and at this point now we have our second step so it's going here and it's going back down that is a negative going step so if you find the derivative of that, that is going to be a negative going impulse. So you draw the negative going impulse. We're sketching it right here. So we have a negative going impulse doing that. Yeah? Continuing now, we have for the x2 part of it, 
we have a step of this height. So the derivative of that is going to be at the same point, we're going to have a positive going impulse. And we come down here now. And at this point here, we have another step going this way that ends the measurement. So what's the derivative there? You're going to have a negative going impulse at that point. And then, of course, in between here, we have dx to dt. Make sense? Yeah, no, maybe. Good. And of course, at any time, if something is making sense, interrupt me, OK? Right, so what we have here now, let's look at, at um, um, everything. Like they used to say in Sesame Street, um, put it all together and what do you get? So we add up these things. So this one is all right. This one, we have a negative going one that is of bigger magnitude than the positive going impulse, both at T2. So the net result here is that at this point, we're going to have a net negative impulse and then here we have a negative impulse so if you do that this is a shorthand for exactly what we were doing this is the first impulse this is the first impulse this is the second impulse and this is the third impulse here the second one really two impulses happening both are t2 one positive and one negative and when you put everything down now, when you map everything together, my slide seems to have stopped. Just a second. Sorry, I think I lost connection there. Are you hearing me now? Right, so if we, this is where I was, the connection seemed to be giving a little bit of problems here. Are you still hearing me? Let me know if it is disappearing. I'm not too sure. Okay, are you here? Just now. Okay. So we go back here now. So, so we have the two impulses and we summarize everything now on one final diagram. So if I were to take the signal that was coming in before, as I said, let's assume it might be a velocity signal. When I integrate that velocity signal, what I end up getting now, I differentiate the, the, the velocity signal and I'm getting my acceleration data. It's working all good and well here. So I'm getting a true derivative. I'm getting a true derivative, but I have these impulses being created. So I have one here, one here, and one here. So the system has to handle this, All right? How does the system, what is the impulse response of the system to that? Okay, and you may not, well, that is one of the things that, that if the system is not designed um, to cater for, that you're going to run into issues with, yeah? So questions before we move on. Yes, Jama. Hi, sir. Um, could you please go over the the last part in, um, I think it was on slide uh, 21? Mm-hmm. Let me try and get this back up here. Slide 21. Right, so you wanted, um, which part? You wanted to go over what we did? Yes, sir. Okay. So you understand, first off, you understood how we 
broke this um the the this the piecewise continuous signal into um sections and the, the sections are separated by unit steps so when the, the, the signal appears there's a unit step and when it disappears there's another unit step you understand up to this point yes sir right so if you know once you understand that then the rest diagrammatically is what we were saying so you have the signal so at this point the signal now has a step if i'm finding the derivative there's a step here there's a signal in the middle and there's a step here so at least for x1 if i try to find the derivative of x1 this positive going step the, the, the derivative of that is going to give me a positive going impulse dx1 dt well it's continuous in that zone so we're going to get something happening here and then at the end of the signal when it temporarily disappears or something happens to cause the discontinuity we have a negative going step so we're going to get a negative going impulse here for x2 x2 at the same time x1 and well x is the same signal but when the, the signal suddenly changes value from x1 to x2, the new value of x2 at, at the same point is given by, it starts with a step, it goes from zero to this value. And then when it ends, it goes from whatever value it is back to zero at here. So the derivative there is going to be here is a positive going impulse, and here is a negative going impulse. So when you work out the magnitudes now, the derivative, and of course in the middle here, you had whatever the derivative of the continuous signal at that point would have been. So when you put it now, you have an impulse to start, you have a derivative. Here you have a positive going impulse and a negative going impulse at the same time instant, because there were two steps that were occurring at the same place. So whichever one, visually, we can see that the, the negative going impulse in impulse is larger than the positive so the net result of these two is going to be a, a negative going impulse and then here you have another negative so when you put everything on one diagram this is what the derivative of that piecewise continuous signal looks like the parts that we want the part that we want is this right the parts that are going to give us trouble are these right how does the system cope with impulsive changes on it it may have been designed not to cater for that it may not have been you don't know right but good system design this is why um this is why we're looking at this kind of thing this is what good system design is supposed to cater for what is the worst case scenario that can happen to that. And these kind of things not catering for the worst case scenario is what caused the, um, I don't know if you remember, um, a couple of years ago with the Boeing 787 planes, right? Is not catering for our worst case. They were actually, there's a system, a very nice control system that is supposed to simplify things for fly, um, for the pilot. So they're flying, yeah, they, they um, beautiful. And that what, what that is supposed to do is that it senses certain attitude changes in the plane, meaning if the nose is going up and down and it adjusts the, 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 the stabilizers in the back to keep the plane flying level. But the attitude changes require a sensor to work. And it just so happened that the sensor didn't work on these two planes. And for something that costs a couple of dollars, what, what would normally happen in critical um, situations is that you have more than one sensor and if the sense, if one sensor fails, or the sensors are not agreeing, which is what your software engineering um, lecturers will tell you, if you're taking readings from multiple sensors and they are not agreeing when they should, the system should um, exactly it lacked redundancy. But it should also have um, the algorithms and everything should have a mechanism that if two things, if one fails, of course it let you know, and there's a redundant backup for it. Or if two things are working and something is not agreeing between the two measurement systems that the pilot should have been informed 
in this case that didn't happen the system i, I think it was a um, it was a, a velocity sensor a speed, a air speed sensor and it it it, it was fouled so that the plane assumed something else was happening and it tried to um it, it assumed that because it was foul that the plane was going down so it tried to pull up the nose the pilot tried to push the nose down and there was a battle that ensued between the the, 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 the mechanical system and the pilot and the pilots lost in both cases that is what happens when you don't design the cater for um failing um signals missing signals wrong signals or like in our case, as we will see, um, impulses that appear when they shouldn't. All right, so just think about it. You have your circuit and you wire it up on a breadboard and a wire is loose. Every time they wire, if you're doing certain things and you have a continuous signal coming in and you're doing certain types of functions on, on the, that signal, if it's a derivative type function that you're doing, every time the wire gets loose and gets reconnected, the system is subjected to an impulse somewhere, right? And that now has its own effect, which is what we're going to look at um, in, in the next part of this. All right, so so um, we fear on that. They understand what we're dealing with. Yeah. Right. So let me go back here. All right. And talk a little bit about specifically about now um, step and impulse response. And we're going to, this will follow us through some other things um, that we look at um, in, in some lectures in the, in the following weeks as well. All right? So just um, in perspective and a little reality check. So what is the purpose of this? Well, to, 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 to pass signals and systems. Yeah, great. No, um, the, the, the whole idea of doing this or doing engineering is um to re remember first engineering is applied science so you're taking what the the pure scientists the, the sort of information and the theories that they produce and we're trying to make something useful with it and the things that we make in broad terms we call them systems and systems are usually designed to meet some set of requirements it's a solve a problem the signals and systems analysis is to try to figure out or determine how the system will respond to the signals that is likely to be subjected to. And in a real life um, situation is usually, as we mentioned before, it's not usually possible to predict every kind of thing that will happen to um, that the system, every kind of signal that a system will be subjected to. So we have our test signals to deal with. So instead of testing it with every known possibility, we have some things that, that simulate the behavior and if they work well according to the simulated behavior we have a fairly good um we have fairly good confidence that is going to react well in the real life and those signals of course were what we mentioned before this the, the the impulse the step the ramp and the sinusoid but most the the, the most common ones would be the, the impulse the step and the sinusoid right the ramp would come in occasionally more more in controls um for certain types of applications yeah and what we usually know if you're given a problem the kind of things that you know are what the absolute limits are so going into a design if if you have some design thing um okay so you're making something uh, a system to measure earthquakes right you know it's supposed to sense earthquakes according to a particular scale so there's a lower limit, which of course is nothing, to an upper limit, which is a magnitude, whatever is the maximum magnitude on the earthquake scale, nine or whatever it is, right? And you also know what sort of frequencies they say the, the, the system is, is maybe going to handle. So if you're talking about um, an audio system, you know that it's going to handle audio frequencies, which is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. If you're dealing with um, um, biomedical systems, for instance, systems that look at the signals from, from the human brain, you're dealing with signals that may be fraction, fractions of a hertz to maybe a few hundred hertz, okay? If you're in the communication field, you're going to be dealing with signals that are in the gigahertz range. So it goes all the way through, all right? But the thing is, is that 
if you're solving a problem, you know certain things. What are the absolute limits of the inputs and the outputs? You also know things like what is the speed of what speed of response is desired. So some things require a very fast response. Okay, so you're driving, um, you're driving a vehicle and, and, and you step on the brake, so you turn the steering. The car is supposed to respond instantly to that. Um, you're moving, you, you, you have an industrial queen and it's moving, um, you know, the wanton um, cement bags around the place. Okay, so that may, you, it may have a delay when, when you start to move, it may move a lot slower than, than a vehicle response. All right, and then you have some other things, for instance, an incubator where, where you have um, premature children. You have the baby in there. So if it has to respond to, let's say, on a day like yesterday, where they said well, um, it was the hottest day on record in Trinidad for the year. So the incubator has to keep a temperature of, mm, let's say, at, uh, 27 degrees Celsius. Under normal conditions, our outside temperature may be 31. Yesterday, I think it went up to just under 35. So does the incubator suddenly react to that kind of thing or does it react nice and slowly? You're dealing with a baby, a premature baby. So you want it to, you know, the, the response is, is, um, is determined by this type of application. And of course, the range of responses. What is the span of acceptable values? Again, is, is back to that. So if you're dealing with um, a battery powered device that is working on, on, on a nine volt battery for argument's sake, then the acceptable values, there's no way that the gain of the amplifiers inside of that could generate a response that requires 20 volts coming out. If batteries are nine volts, it can happen. All right, so those, those kind of things. So you know all of these things, right? And we mentioned some of that. Those of you who, who um, have been with me um, in, in, in the electronics class so far, we mentioned that about this, this circuit design issues, that you deal with things, you have an idea of the voltages and the currents um, that, that, that the circuit is supposed to um, cater to or cater for, and you build in a little bit of margin, um, but that's it, right? Anything outside of that, um, it wouldn't respond to, or it's supposed to do something else, shut down or just, um, you know, you know um, insulate itself in, in whatever way from an, an input or an output out of range, right? So that's what we're doing. We, 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 we have problems to solve. And when you're given a problem, like later on next year, when, when, when some of you are project, if you have something to design, ask yourself about what are the limits? You know, um, what is this going to do? What are the range of values? Um, what sort of um, frequencies I need? How fast it is, does it need to respond? How accurate it needs to be? And all those kind of things. So, so you always put down what you know before you start to, to, to jump into the system itself. And then based on that now, you, you, um, if you know certain things about the outputs, you could kind of figure out what the inputs will be. You might not know the shape of the signal. So for instance, a continuous time um, temperature signal coming from a human being, you have no idea what the shape of that might be. But what you can do is to test the system with the low end, with a temperature signal coming in at the low end of its range, at the middle end of the range, at the high end of the range, and see if it, reads, if, if it reads those values accurate, accurately. And then to cater for changes within those ranges, you could have it working and then you switch it on and you switch it off so that puts like a step, a step signal on it and those kind of things, right? And we use, because we can't do, do everything, we take some standard signals, and if we know how it responds to the standard signal, we are fairly confident that we know how it will behave in, in reality. Okay, and one of the, 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 the typical uh, the two typical tests that we tend to do in controls and in most types of applications are the step response test and the impulse response test. And these signals have characteristics. Well, we already saw part of the characteristic. It's suddenly changing from one value to another, or it is subjected to a value over a short period of time that goes from nothing to a very high amplitude and then come back down. So intuitively, you should see that it, it, it is subjecting um, the, the system to something 
very unordinary. And you're looking to see how it is going to respond to that. When we do the Fourier series and the Fourier transform part, you're going to see some more information about the, 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 the content of the step response and the impulse response, and which is why it makes it such a, a, a rigorous test on, on most systems. So an example of a step response. What is it, what you have a circuit here, so you have a DC, a simple RC circuit. What is the response of this circuit when you switch it on? You assume, let's say that they, 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 you could assume a number of things that the capacitor has a charge or it doesn't. And what you want to know is what is the sort of behavior when you turn this thing on? And you did through all of those things. You did this even um, in math. You would have done this last year. You would have done this in high school probably as well. The, the input output equation is a simple first order differential equation. And you can solve it by integrating it and getting factors. Or now that you learn the, 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 the engineer's shorthand, which is something called a Laplace transform, um, we mostly solve our equations, um, any differential equation we would, that we have to solve, we usually solve it by invoking the Laplace transform and um, using that, manipulating it, and then solving it. So if the capacitor is discharged, for instance, meaning that the initial condition is, is zero, you end up with a, an equation. So when you apply the Laplace transform, Ys is the transform of the output. Xs is the transform of the input. Now, if you remember from the Laplace transform, if Xs is a unit step, right? If Xs is a unit step, meaning that that let's say what the, the, the system is switched on. So nothing, and this is the input here. The Laplace transform of a unit step is one over S. So the transform of the output is now this, which is the transform of the system by one over S. If the unit, and that is a unit step, right? If the transition was from zero to 15 volts, and you're dealing with everything in terms of voltage, then you, instead of this, you would have half 15 over S. Yeah? You just, it's just a constant. So now that you have that, how do you find YT? Well, you remember all your stuff with Laplace transforms and inverse transforms and so on. So you, you multiply it out and you use partial fractions if you have to, and then you go to our table and you finish now, you get that the Laplace transform, from the Laplace transform, that the real world signal output, sorry, the real output here, having some difficulties here. Anyway, seem to have some pointing difficulties with my pointer. The real output would look like that. So what does that look like? ut minus e to the minus t over rc you plot it and you get something looking like that this is where this is just arbitrary where rc is 10 right so you have some some value of resistance some value of capacitor right it's stretching or oh, this is extremely that's an extremely long time constant by most by most arguments so you have put a step into the system a step voltage, the system switches on. This is what goes in, and this is what is coming out. Right, so notice that the, the system, right, the system is supposed to do this, and ideally, if, if you did this, the system should give you that coming out, but instead, it gives you this blue line. So there's an increase on, on this particular thing. It takes quite a, a bit of time before it actually settles to the one value. But you couldn't do that without doing the mathematics. There's no way of knowing that. The alternative would have been to build a circuit and turn it on, put an oscilloscope on the output, and see what they, what it looked like. And if you had no on the output, and you had the wrong parts, or you put the oscilloscope on the wrong scale, then you're not going to see anything, or you're going to damage something. right? 
And you remember here from this that the part where it's changing is what you call the transient response. And the part where it is not changing is what you call the steady state response. So when you put the input, in this case, when you put a step input into a system, the system behaves in a particular way. It takes time to settle down, and the time during the time it's taking to settle down is what you call the transient response time. This is the part when the, it is changing, and then eventually it will settle down to something, and that's the steady state response part of the uh, of, of the um, the behavior. Yeah. Now, what about the impulse response? If you take the impulse response, the first thing the impulse is delta t. So, what's the Laplace transform of an impulse? Should I remember that from the last time? The Laplace transform of an impulse is heavy side. What do you mean? The step? No, the Laplace transform of the step is 1 over S Saja. Nope. So, when in doubt, you go back to what the definition of the impulse is. Remember what an impulse is. An impulse, if you multiply an impulse by something, it sifts out the value of the impulse uh, of the function at t equal to zero. So look at this, the Laplace transform, the formula for the Laplace transform is the integral f t e to the minus s t dt. And of course, you integrate just before zero to infinity. Right, we're not going with negative signals here. Ft is the impulse, delta t. So if you look right here, we have delta t multiplying by e to the minus st. This bit, the integral of delta t dt, that is the definition of the impulse basically. So what it's going to do is to pick out the value of e to the st at t equal to naught, which is? one so therefore the laplace transform of a delta function is one yeah fair enough make sense right remember that sifting property anytime you multiply an impulse by something um, the result is that the impulse is going to sift out the value of that, whatever function it is, at the time of the impulse. So in this case, it's going to sift out the value of e to the st, e to the minus st, sorry, at t equal to one, 0, because it's delta t, so t equal to 0, and that gives you 1. So if you do that now, the equation, remember, here was x, s, which is equal to one because X is our delta. So you do that and you get that e to the, um, that yt, sorry, is e to the minus t over rc on rc. What does that look like? It gives you this sort of behavior. So you have the rc circuit and the impulse comes in. Impulse, something like that, right? You can't create it in reality with the kind of thing. So let's say you wanted to turn on the circuit. You turned it on, so the power is rising. Something blows, and or the, 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 the power supply, your power supply suddenly switches off. So it comes here, it goes down here. So it rises up to a little value, and then suddenly comes back down to zero. How does it, the, the, the RC circuit respond to it? Well, the same sort of thing. It, it's coming here, it rises because it's trying to follow the, the impulse, but the impulse goes back down. So just at that point in time, the circuit dies away again. Yeah? So from those two scenarios, with, with, without building the circuit, you, you, you see if the circuit, one, um, one how is the circuit responding, and two, what happens to the circuit if certain things happen. So when you switch on the circuit, if you go back here, you're seeing that the, when you switch on the circuit, you're seeing that the circuit is taking 
um, just for these sort of values, right? The circuit is taking 60 seconds, almost a minute. When I put a step input, when I turn it on, it's taking almost a minute, in this case, before the output appears. Is that good or bad? Only you will know if that was the design function. The other thing is that if I switch it on and something would have happened, so it was subjected to an impulse, then what's going to happen, the output, as you put an impulse on the, in, on, on the input, the output will try to follow it, but then it just dies up. So it goes up a little bit. Notice that this, this point here is not too high, it's at point 0.1. Remember, it's a unit. It's a one, the impulse, the ideal impulse is supposed to have a weight of one. So it goes up and then it just comes back down. So it, it, in, in that time duration, it went up to 10% of the output and then it died back down. And again, the time constant, same time constant, so it's dying back down in about the same 60 seconds. All right? But in all of these things, you get the idea that, that, that without building the circuit, just analyzing, if you know enough about the circuit, you can get an idea of what the thing is, uh, is going to do. Now we're going to meet, especially the step impulse, we're going to see that, that, that the step impulse in certain types of systems, this is a first order system here that we're dealing with. It only has one derivative. All right. That's not where am I? Yeah, the RC circuit is, is, is a simple first order system. The real funny behavior for these things happen when you're dealing, where when you start, uh, this is first order, when you start to deal with second order and above. And above. At second order and above, the system now starts to respond very differently to, to, to steps and to impulses. And we're going to spend some time looking at that in, in, in a few lectures later on. Right? There's some analysis that, that, that you have to do. And that now, when, when you reach to, um, to control systems next year, you're going to use that to, to analyze things like stability of systems, because most systems are not first order. A simple RC circuit is, is is good for teaching and for understanding the principles. But most systems are not first order. They are second and above. And being engineers, we we, um, we have a very pragmatic approach. So if you have a system that is higher than a second order, what we do is to break it down into a combination of first and second order systems. And we analyze them as such. And we'll see how we're able to do that. Part of that, that will, will be a, a, um, something else that we'll discuss after in the next um, half of the class. All right, so any questions on, on what we did here so far? All right, everybody's following me? All right, great. Okay, so we will take a short break here and then we'll come back Afterwards, um, it's 1.54, so at 1 o'clock, uh, 2 o'clock, sorry, let's take a, a small little break here. I'll stop the recording at this point.